I invite you to stand as you're able for the reading of our scripture this morning. Our scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, beginning with verse 33 through 37. Listen as God speaks to us from his word. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Who's in charge around this place? That's been asked a few times at 424 Lakeside Drive. That's where your parsonage is. <laughs> but on every Friday, I'm given a charge. It's supposed to be my day off when I don't get a haircut. I'm entitled and, in fact, expected to take care of the clergy household's dirty laundry. So I'm to do, as I grew up, the washing, all right? And so I start that, and then I go and do some other things. This time I need to clean up after a Sunday school party we'd had, so I was carrying out the trash. I was given a homework assignment by a seminary student here in town that I agreed to tell him about the Methodist doctrine and polity, how we put our faith into practice. Took two lines, but I had to work at it. And then I, I got a little busy. I threw a load in the, lawn, in the dryer. I put another load in the wash. And before I knew it, it was lunchtime. And so I ate some lunch. And I turned on TV and Top Gear was on. And so I was watching the episode about a Ferrari because that makes good sense, right? And uh, I fell asleep, all right, which is a no-no when you're left in charge. And before I know it, the phone is ringing. And the one who's really in charge was on her way home. So I quickly threw the last load of laundry in the dryer, but I didn't fold it. And I tried to smile real big, greet her into the house. I think I lit a candle, reminded her that we were going out to eat that night. But the next morning, for some reason, she said, you're not getting credit for doing laundry this week. All right? So who's really in charge? around there. Someone's always got to be in charge. In fact, we just had a charge conference as a church where we said, hey, the finance committee would be in charge of these. They're going to take care of it all. Don't worry. All right. The SPRC is in charge of making sure I'm doing my job and the staff, the trustees are in charge of making sure the building's kept up. Everybody's given a charge. Some people are asking if anyone's in charge at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. You might have to look up that location, all right? We wonder who is in charge. Pilate wondered who was in charge. Pilate, the governor of Judea, the one who represented, the one who truly was in charge, Caesar of Rome had a question about one being a king or not being a king. And a charge was to be levied against him, but he would say, in him I have found no charge. But Pontius Pilate still to this day, when we recite the creed, the Apostles' Creed about how we believe in Jesus Christ, the one and only Son of the Father, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried on the third day, he rose again. He sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the quick and the dead. Pontius Pilate is still spoken about today as a governor, not as Caesar. That is the power of a king. His question came about because the Jewish leaders brought to them one named Jesus, who was from Nazareth, who was making claims that they did not agree with, and since Passover was quickly coming, they could not defile themselves, they could not make themselves unclean, so they did not enter into the headquarters of Pilate that day. Instead, they dropped him off and had him delivered and handed over. He had been arrested. He would later be beaten. But this was the time of a questioning, a hearing, so to speak, about should there be a grand jury? Should there be a trial? Is there any real evidence that speaks to who this Jesus is? And they were upset, and they wanted to make it to where Jesus was contradicting Rome and its authority. And so they had planted seeds out there about Jesus' claim. Or perhaps Jesus hadn't claimed anything at this time. And so the question comes about, are you the king? Now if Jesus would have said, yes, I'm the king, he would have been guilty of subversion and therefore crucified immediately by Rome. But the full question is, in all the Gospels, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus responds back to Pilate. Is this your idea, Mr. Pilate? Or have you been talking to some other people? Usually, most of the ideas that we have are not original. They come from small talk. They come from the words of others about who's in charge. He asked them that question, and Pontius' uh, remark was one of disassociation for sure. Am I a Jew? Y'all know the answer to that, right? He was a Roman. He's not a Jew. He works for Caesar. His whole job is to maintain the empire's status, collect money, and have no conflict. That's basically the goal of every lazy leader. That's why I'm here with you today. All right? Just maintain an even strain. Don't get anyone too excited. Don't ask things that are not to be asked. Don't encourage people to do something above and beyond. Just coast through life, and it'll all be okay. But if there's a king involved, that makes things a little different, doesn't it? Jesus says, well, you know, truth is, my kingdom's not the same. If it were, they wouldn't have let me be arrested. They would have fought for me. They would have died for me. And by the way, did the apostle Peter fight for Jesus? Knocked Ocaiaphas' servant's ear off with his sword, right? Jesus just kind of like picked it up and like, Putty just stuck it right back on there and told Peter, put that up. Now that's not what we're here about. That wasn't his goal. In fact, he begins to talk about a kingdom in a different way. Are you a king? If so, the implied is, show me your kingdom. Show me your capital. Show me your buildings. Show me your places of honor, your seats of power. Show me what a king is all about. He'd already spoken in the chapter just prior that his kingdom wasn't the same, and neither was his disciples. They, kingdoms are complicated, and kings are complicated, and, and we're from a nation that we don't like kings at all. You think those pilgrims were in favor of kings back on that first Thanksgiving? But boy, they were giving thanks to Christ the king that day for Squanto and Somerset, weren't they? Yeah, kingdoms are not always what they appear. And kings are not how we think of them on earth, 
but in a heavenly realm is what Jesus was saying. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. There is a king who has come and who will come again. Jesus spoke of his kingdom as being one of truth. For this cause I was born and I came to this world to testify to the truth. Now before he'd said that, Pilate had said, so you are a king. Even a Roman subject appointed for rule understood that there was something special about this one named Jesus. Even in our United States of America, when an official takes an oath, by the way, it's not written and recorded for the president, but at the end of it, when he lays his hand upon a Bible and raises his right hand and testifies, at the end, what do they say now out of tradition? So help me, God. We need a king. Now, I know our American ears are sensitive to that, right? They're like, oh, Jerry, we fought to not have a king. Well, did we? George Washington had to fight to not be called a king. I liken it to Harry S. Truman. No one knows anything about Harry S. Truman except for he dropped the bomb and also this one thing. The buck stops here. All right? Taking responsibility and authority from the one who has given it. Jesus stops the buck there and tells his whole mission. I have come to testify to the truth. Now, people have a mind about what that might be and what they might perceive in a king. Even Israel itself, who had God as its creator, God as its sovereign Lord, wanted a king. First Samuel. Samuel's the last judge. He's about to kill over. Chapter 8, verse 5. This is how they treat people when they're old. Remember this, kids. You are an old man, and your sons are not following in your way. I'm going to tell all older people that every time I see them now. It's biblical, right? He says, so appoint for us a king so that we might be like all the other nations. Was Israel supposed to be like all the other nations? Not at all. And then we advance to this New Testament, and Jesus is still often referred to and his Messiahship as the son of David, the one king that they really, really liked. The king that was of the sword that expanded the nation of Israel as far as land like had never been seen, but also death. And he had a trouble with the ladies a little bit there for a season. He had trouble with his enemies and his own boys. Oh my gosh, they made mine look great. Okay, so he had problems, but they were endeared to King David. So when a Messiah comes, a king, behold, is coming to you. We'll be hearing those words soon in the season of Advent. They had an imagery in their mind, just like we often do, of who should be in charge. But who should be in charge? Who is this king? Where is his kingdom? And what is it about? It is about truth. John's Gospel, chapter 1, we're reading out of John's Gospel today, verse 14 says that the Word became flesh and lived and dwelled among us, full of grace and truth, one as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. His whole mission was about being truthful. John 14, 6, Jesus Himself says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ is the King. Who will follow and how do they know Him? There was no charge brought against Him, but if you've ever continued on through the Passion narrative, Christ the King is intended for us to remember that for a moment, even the Romans, the citizens of this world, recognized like a citizen of the other world, Jesus Christ's lordship. Just as we'd said during wiggle time, every 
Knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The way that we are identified is do we listen to his voice? Do we follow the truth? Jesus said in John 13, 35, They will know that you are my disciples by your love that you have one for the other. Today we are called to become loyal subjects. To lay ourselves before the mighty king. How difficult that can be. But what greater time than this week in our nation's life together. As we gather around the table, I challenge you to profess truth at your tables. To be honest with one another. To ask each other, have we served Christ as king? Because he will come again to judge the quick and the dead. Often we hear debates in our towns, our communities, about where are the people, where are the folks. The truth of the matter is, they're in Altus, they're in Jackson County. But you may have some coming from out of town, and they're sitting at their table, and their pastor may be saying, where are the people, where are the folks? I know what you're saying, oh, Jerry, you quit preaching, you went to meddling. doesn't count for my family. It counts for all of us, because we are servants of the mighty Christ, the King. To get honest about what our purpose is. If we serve a king, then that makes us subjects. So the truth is, in the English term, we are all called stewards. Stewards are not the king. They do not live in Jerryville, okay? That's a completely fabricated story in case you're wondering, all right? Subjects are given authority by someone above them. I am given authority on Friday to do what? Laundry by the Queen of Jerryville. All right? That part is true. I messed it up because I was not a good steward. I will be punished throughout all of my days to do laundry on Friday, right? That will be the punishment for my crime. Have y'all all committed a crime here, by the way? I have. More than laundry or not hanging it up. It's called sin. We might call it dirty laundry, huh? And a king gave his life to take away that sin. So I feel this extreme loyalty, but sometimes I have that sin of getting in the way. And I want to be a Lord myself. I want to lord it over others as the Gentiles do sometimes. But as a subject, I'm called the steward. We have a card here that we will be bringing forth on the first Sunday of the new year. Do y'all know when that is, by the way? Next Sunday. Very good. Tell all of your non-believing friends it's not January 1. Or people that don't go to a church that recognizes the Christian calendar. We'll be bringing forth a commitment, a card. And on that, you get to determine how you will honor and serve your king. There's many ways to do so. Obviously, when we take vows, we say we will do so with our prayers, right? We have demonstrated that today here with the prayer quilt in our time of corporate prayer and our time of, with the children. We say we will do so with our presence. One time as a bold pastor, which I am no longer because I have been beat down and learned my lesson. I gave a challenge that if people would come to worship, we would take them out to one place that still took Sundays off, Chick-fil-A. All right? And the kids went berserk. You know, you know how these kids, they will like do anything for Chick-fil-A, even say Jesus' name for Chick-fil-A. And I said, but you have to be present. I give you two Sundays off for vacation. I give you up to four between sick days or if you visited another place of worship when you were out of town. That was six Sundays. That was over 10%. See, your pastor knows how to do math. All right, I hope you do as well on these. And we set that goal, and at the year's end, there was one family and the piano player that we took out to eat on a Saturday at Chick-fil-A. It was a congregation that averaged 150 a Sunday. 
We could have averaged 300 a Sunday. You guys could be averaging 400 a Sunday at the first Sunday of the year, which is when? Next week. I'm not waiting to January 1. Why should we? We serve a king. And if you don't serve the king, it doesn't work out good for us, does it? He wore a crown of thorns for our sake. I want to be the best steward that he has called me to be, and I can't do it without his help. My presence is because I need your presence to be in his presence. Prayers, presence, gifts, service, witness. Those are all part of the vows that we take. And I told you we had 1,747 members. We've added four since then. 1,751 members. I'm willing to write off 700 of them to just say they were no good. Y'all want to say that 700 of our people were no good? You know something? Can I get an amen? <laughs> 700 of our people are no good. I don't know where they're at, do you guys? So do we have 1,000 good ones? Remember when Abraham was petitioning God not to smite Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember that story about, oh, but what if there are 50 righteous, Lord? Would you destroy all of this town? And God just kind of, oh, good luck finding them. And it just keeps going down. It's like this negotiating. If I can find just one good one, would you save the town? Y'all know what happened to Sodom? Gone. It was a magnifying glass in Jerryville, right? Just gone. That's what happened to them. Folks, we don't have to be good. God calls us to be righteous. And he died to take away the sins of the world so that we could be saved by grace through faith, which was not of our own account, though any of us might boast. But it's the free gift of God. A king gifted us the keys to the kingdom. For that... I will work. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us pray. Holy are you, Lord. God Almighty. A king who could have any crown, any treasure, but you treasured the people that you created. The Father gave of His Son so that we might have life and life everlasting. You spoke the truth. You testified to it. And you called us to walk in truth. Lord, it hurts when we hear the truth about how your holy church here upon this earth is struggling all throughout the United States of America. That bothers me, Lord. If it bothers me, it must pain you. Lord, you have called us to a place of stewardship, management. Your promises, you're not slow in keeping them, but it's you are a patient God so that none might be lost. Help the Methodist Church, First United Methodist Church, of Altus America to get off of its derriere and go reach some people for the king. We'd do it for just about any other cause. Will he do it for Christ the king? Help us, Lord, as we gather around a table to call into an account as a family, to have the conversations, Lord, about how are we stewarding what you have given us authority over our children and our children's children, the homes that we live in, the vocations that we have been called to. It is all yours. Lord, there's a superintendent of schools, but you are Christ the King. Lord, there's a mayor of Altus, but you are Christ the King. There's a governor of Oklahoma, but you are Christ the King. There's a bishop somewhere in the United Methodist Church that we can't find. You are Christ the King. There's a pope for the Catholic people, but you are Christ the King. There was Caesar, and even Pilate recognized that you were and are 
a king. He just didn't know you as Christ. We do, Lord. We honor you. All glory is yours now and forever. Jesus Christ, our King. In his name we pray. Amen.